start with several motivational parts. One, actually on temporal lobe epilepsy, which is what I did during my PhD, then go into my current project, talk about optogenetics and why that might be very helpful there, and then talk about the current technologies and why we think that fiber probes are actually a good approach as a new technology. So then I will continue to talk on about the fabrication of these probes, the characterization, and obviously the application, and finish with some statements on biocompatibility. There are two things I like to talk about beforehand. One is I like to show this slide where pretty much most um, kinds of brain signal that we currently record are um, shown. So on the y-axis, we have the speed of those signals going from fast signals such as spikes to um, fMRI signals. And on the x-axis, we have the space. How far does one of these signals actually um, go to be capable of being measured? And I show that to show you that I pretty much exclusively play around in these two fields, in the fields of field potentials and spikes and um, the correlation of those two signals. Um, and the other thing is when I prepared for this talk, I looked back to my time in Hanover and thought, um, what did I learn there? And at that time, I spent a significant amount of time on building um, monopolar electrodes that took several days to build um, via hand. And the two things I learned at that time is that the auditory cortex in these beds is actually larger than it was published, and that there must be a much better way to build those electrodes. So then I changed for my PhD and went towards a um, temporal lobe epilepsy mouse model, and I had a very different approach of electrodes, which I consider almost the simplest of all electrodes. You just take a piece of insulated metal wire, and in a relatively wild soldering freestyle experience, you solder them to a connector above an anesthetized mouse. So the final Im finally, the implant looks like that. And we used that, as I said, for um, temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a very common form of uh, focal epilepsies. And it's often drug resistance. So that's bad. And we used those electrodes to record from this mouse model of temporal lobe epilepsy and found exciting things in the field potential region, so in the sum of um, a lot of electrical activities in um, the regions. And as long as you are interested in oscillations in several um, frequency bands, for example, this is a sketch of the theta rhythm between 4 and 8 hertz in the brain with a superimposed gamma rhythm between 30 and 80 hertz, that's great. And we found great things. However, we never found a way to actually explain why some findings that had changed in these oscillations actually led to epilepsy. Hence, those electrodes were nice for that, but we decided we also need spikes. So we had to go into a different approach, which was the use of specifically for those regions in the brain, namely the hippocampus, that were affected or are affected mostly in temporal lobe epilepsy, um, we developed those um, silicon-based probes with um, platinum iridium um, active zones to record from these um, regions. And we successfully recorded both field potentials um, and simultaneously spikes at several of um, those channels. Um, however, since we were recording from a lot of different structures, which um, meant we had a very low resolution here. Um, we never could know what cell actually, or what cell type actually fires here. So after that, 
I changed. I mean, you have the option if you see something like that. So either you change your question or you change your methods. And I decided to do both because I could do that here and moved to um, the autism spectrum field with the help of the Simon Center. Um, and autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder with heterogeneous phenotypes, and it's also quite common. Um, in terms of reported incidents, it's apparently more common in the US than worldwide, but that might have very heterogeneous regions, uh, reasons. And in particular, I am interested in uh, the Shank 3 knockout mouse model that has been generated in the Fang lab here. This mouse model shows um, strong repetitive behavior, namely over grooming which leads to lesions which are visible <coughs> in the phenotype. And here you see that the wild type spends less um, time grooming than um, the knockout mouse. And they also show a social deficit. But for now, I'm concentrating on um, that repetitive behavior. The Shank 3 um, RNA can abundantly be found in medial spinal neurons in the basal ganglia of um, normal mice. And what this Shank 3 protein actually is, it is a postsynaptic scaffold protein, meaning if that uh, might be missing, the idea is that the transmission from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron is actually impaired. And that would lead to less activity. And in fact, in slices um, and patch clamp studies performed in the Fang lab, the wild type uh, medial spinal neurons showed a much um, higher frequency of activity and also amplitudes as compared to the knockout. How could this finding now explain repetitive behavior? So let's think about how this movement um, is generated in the first place. Um, usually signals to move a muscle in the body in the basal ganglia come from the thalamus via the motor cortex, um, which then excites the muscle. And normally, if you don't want to move, um, the globus pallidus intern and the, the substantia nigra are um, inhibiting the thalamus to prevent that muscle movement. And if you now have a decision to move, then um, the, the uh, dopaminergic um, receptor type 1 neurons in the 3 atom will become active and inhibit this globus pallidus, which then stops to inhibit the thalamus, so we have movement following this decision. This is also known as the direct basal ganglia pathway for uh, movement, but these mice show um, a lot of movement, so it looks like the initiation of movement is not the issue here, but it may be the control of movement. And in the control of movement, we have um, dopaminergic uh, receptor type 2 neurons in the striatum that get activated, then inhibit the globus pallidus, which fails then to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. Um, which normally excites the globus pallidus, which usually inhibits the thalamus, which under normal condition prevents, um, uh, stops the movement of the muscle. So we can imagine that if in this indirect uh, basal ganglia pathway something goes wrong, namely in this um, region, which is the most likely since Shank 3 is um, expressed in uh, those neurons, then there will be an issue um, in terms of controlling the movement, which is exactly what we see in that phenotype. However, showing um, a direct correlation um, of activity in that brain to an overgrooming behavior in vivo in freely moving um, mice um, is relatively tricky. But um, here, optogenetics can be helped of help to um, identify specific cells, those D2 neurons. Um, so optogenetics, we have chenorhodopsin. Chenorhodopsin is um, inserted in the neuronal membrane. 
and serves as an um, alternative channel following light activation, usually in um, the range of 473 nanometers um, in the blue range. And after activation of that um, channel, we can reliably see um, neural activity following those um, laser pulses or LED pulses, um, whatever you decide to use. And the approach to make use of that in the basal ganglia would be to identify neurons with D1 or D2 receptors by um, viral transfection. So we, we make use of a Cree recombinase in those uh, neurons and directly target those neurons using that to implement this um, channel directly into either D1 or D2 receptor containing neurons. If we then activate um, the region using laser light, ideally only those neurons should fire. And if we um, remember those action potentials or the action potential shapes, we will uh, be able to see afterwards how exactly um, those neurons that were identified via um, optogenetics behave under, control, uh, under um, behavioral um, conditions. So that would be a very direct way of um, correlating behavior to a specific type of neuron, even though you don't have direct um, access like you would have in a slice to those cells. And in the first um, studies that were recently performed, um, we could show that actually by injecting virus into the basal ganglia in those transgenic mice, we could target um, neurons in the basal ganglia. So the next thing we would have to do is put an um, optical stimulation and recording device into uh, the green area here and activate it to um, specifically record from those dopaminergic neurons. However, this requires stable single unit long-term recordings and stimulation at the same time. And with current, current technologies, it has been reported that there is a strong decrease in signal to noise ratio over time, evident, um, for example, here um, in a, in a long-term study um, using Michigan and, and microwire probes. Um, and it's generally um, attributed this decrease in signal to noise ratio um, by uh, to um, glial scarring and neuronal death around the implant, as well as chronic blood brain barrier bre uh, breach. And it has been hypothesized that this might be due to a stiffness mismatch between the brain tissue and the probe tissue. So most neural probes are very stiff, the brain is small like putting. If you um, imagine that you put a stiff piece of metal into the brain, which also is subjected to motion um, to some extent, it's more uh, swirling around. So the probe does not follow the brain. It is attached to the, to the skull. So you will get a lot of tissue damage eventually. And if you want to um, then, in addition, include um, optical simulation, what most um, technologies do is they just add a waveguide um, to an already existing um, recording device that has the same limitation of being stiff and not flexible um, as the recording only versions before. So we thought that we would have to build a better probe to achieve that and the requirements for a better probe are a long-term recording of neural activity, especially at the single unit level, um, stimulation using optogenetics. We also wanted to include drug delivery because it makes sense that if you find an, uh, a mechanism, you might also play around with that and see whether you um, can change some behavior doing that. And it should be minimally invasive. And as a, as a big picture, um, idea. This is how we 
imagine it to look like. So the approach is to have flexible multifunctional probes um, comprising biocompatible polymers and polymer metal composites. Um, those polymers ideally should be already FDA approved. So at some point you might even go into um, the human brain using that technology. It should have a lot of um, functionalities, um, especially for um, animals. At right now for optogenetics we will need waveguides um, and recordings and you name it. But the issue is obviously how would you produce such a probe? And to this end, we borrowed um, the so-called thermal drawing process from the photonics industry. If you send an email from America to Europe, you will most likely go through a um, um, waveguide fiber across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and that is exactly produced in the same way as um, these probes I'm going to talk about. You start with the preform which is on a, on a macro scale level. Imagine a plastic rod that has an inch in diameter. And you build that preform with macro scale machining um, and uh, design all the features you want in the end have, uh, to have as your neural probe at that cross section. Um, you heat it and you draw it with um, controlled stress um, until um, it is very thin while the cross-sectional geometry is preserved in the end. And I have to admit, when I first thought of that, I didn't think it would work because if you hang a plastic rod towards the ceiling and you heat it, I thought it will just drop down and break. But it actually doesn't. So that was most of the times, most of the times. How, do you, how would you design such a macroscopic preform that has the functionalities that we actually want to have in the brain. First, we um, thought about the design. The design being we want to have a waveguide for optogenetic stimulation in the center. We want to have in this design two electrodes um, consisting um, of um, carbonated, um, carbonated uh, polyethylene and two hollow channels for drug delivery. And you can take a polycarbonate rod and surround it with cyclic olefin copolymer um, sheets to constitute your waveguide at um, carbon-loaded uh, conductive polyethylene and machine some holes for the later hollow channels for drug delivery into that. Um, put some more sheets on it, anneal it for some time, and in the end, you have this um, preform that you can put into that draw tower. And this is how it in the end looks. This is the size that we initially had. And this is where it goes down to a smaller size. And by doing that, you have had a macroscopic template, which is then stretched into hundreds of meter long microstructured fiber. This is how um, that can look like. Um, you connect it, and then you have your multifunctional probe, which can do a neural recording, optogenetic simulation, and drug delivery. And in this SEM picture, we see that on the microscale after the draw, um, the cross-sectional geometry that we had in the beginning is actually preserved. We have the polycarbonate waveguide in the center which actually works. We have um, two electrodes and two hollow channels. And we then thought, um, yeah, but is it, can it be bent and will it still contain the functionality to this? And we set up, um, um, uh, set up like this where we repeatedly bent that fiber and measured uh, the light output and even though there are some fluctuations between the relaxed and the bent condition, overall, that light output was very stable. So we went on and implanted that probe into the medial prefrontal cortex of a transgenic thigh one mouse. Um, here we see a PCB to um, connect the electrodes, a ferrule for optical connection, and tubing left and right. 
to enable um, drug delivery. And oops, we um, in the first attempt we recorded those optogenetically evoked um, signals, most likely on a um, multi-unit level here, and we assessed the stability over time. Um, so this is how it looked after two days, and it still worked after a week, and also after a month, and also after two months. So we uh, have some long-term um, functionality here preserved. And since we also had a drug delivery um, capability, we used um, CNQX to um, um, remove um, returned excitation from um, neurons containing rhodopsin towards other um, neurons. And we see that before the CNQX um, injection, uh, we had the strong activity. After that injection, it was uh, mostly gone. And this is the um, trace of the whole experiment. So we extracted the amplitudes and put those as a peak into all these points. And you see that during the um, injection, which is marked uh, with a reddish background here, um, we get the decrease in those amplitudes followed by a recovery phase, um, which is even better visible here. So this was why the pump was constantly on, so it is even possible to record um, continuously while we are injecting through this um, single device. Um, one catch with those um, probes is that they were pretty large for my test, especially if you want to go in a mouse. Um, they are great for rats, and they are pretty very small if you consider all the functionalities they have, because recording requires a recording array. Um, a lot of people put in an optical silica waveguide into the brain next to that to achieve optogenetic stimulation. And then you will have an additional cannula um, to intervene using pharmacology. So that's much more space. But we wanted to have it smaller for um, a lot of purposes. And to get it smaller, we um, made use of a different project, or of our findings from a different project um, for a spinal cord probe, where this flexibility um, of probes is especially important. If you imagine you want to implant a probe into a spinal cord, you should be able the, the probe should be able to follow that movement as you will just make it worse. Um, so the, the concept here was to um, implant one of those fibers into the lumbar spinal cord and record activity from there while actually stimulating um, to elicit an, a response in the gastrocnemius muscle followed by limb movement. And we um, made use of the drawing process again, but this time um, we removed um, a sacrificial layer that was um, used beforehand to achieve um, stable drawing conditions. Um, in the end, to have a much, much um, smaller probe comprising uh, waveguide and recording capabilities that could go into the spinal cord. And this is activity we were recording from the lumbar region there, while at the same time we measured um, EMG um, potentials in the gastrocnemius muscle and observed limb movement on demand. So we can get that smaller. However, another thing we really wanted to have was uh, to have more electrodes in this kind of structure, um, because Especially if you go to those shank 3 dopaminergic systems, those neurons are pretty sparse. So it might help to have, have a lot more electrodes than just two. Um, so the good thing about the thermal drawing process is that you can repeat it. Um, in a first step, you take um, a polyethylene uh, imine rod, for example, and fill it with tin, 
tin being the electrode material you want, you subject it to heat, draw it into a much thinner fiber, and then you take a second rod and take pieces of this first rod, which you then fill the second rod with. You take the second rod, you heat it, and you will have um, something with more electrodes here in the center. And since we used a sacrificial layer here, you can remove um, that afterwards in post-processing. This is how it looks under the, um, under the SEM. Um, this is still the sacrificial layer, while we in the center have these electrodes. Um, this would be a transition from um, unedged to an edged condition. And this is what we are left with after all the sacrificial part is gone, and it actually feels and looks like um, a human hair with a similar diameter, but with, in this case, seven electrodes. We assessed the um, stiffness of those and compared them to um, steel wire um, for at, at several frequencies which are physiologically relevant. Um, and we see that the original fiber performs similar to um, that steel wire, but the edge fiber really is extremely low in terms of stiffness. And to um, characterize the functionality for recordings, we um, assessed um, impedance measurements. So it was in a one mega ohm and um, below regime useful for um, neural recordings, which we then performed. Here we have a trace of spontaneous activity using those devices, uh, again from the prefrontal cortex. And we performed the principal component analysis on that, followed by k means clustering, and extracted two units. This way, um, this trace is a very nice one because the signal to noise ratio actually um, went uh, to almost 20, while on average, if we compare it to other results we have there, we have a 13 plus minus 6 mean plus minus standard deviation, which is much higher than what we had been seen in the beginning um, from those Michigan and microwire probes I showed before, because there the peak was around 3.5. So we, we are convinced we can perform better than that. And as a next step, we try to um, also um, again um, increase the number of um, active recording places, uh, spots in that um, in that probe, and if you want to uh, lower impedance, for example, you can also etch some of um, the polymers surrounding those thin electrodes to expose a um, larger um, piece of, um, of, of your active recording area if you want to get a better contact with um, your uh, neurons. After all these functions, how do those probes perform in terms of biocompatibility. We compared them to microwire um, with four um, different indicators, GFIP, uh, FAP to um, show activated um, um, astrocytes, IBA1 to show activated microglia, ED1 for phagocytosis of that microglia, and IgG as an indicator of blood-brain barrier breach. And we observed that in particular three days um, after implantation, the response to all of these markers from microwire um, um, is much higher than the response to our fiber probes for all those um, four um, things we were um, scanning for. And after three months, it's still pretty comparable. However, please note that the y-axis are different from the top to the bottom. This is a very small immunoresponse after um, three months overall. And we think that actually the initial stages after implantation are the decisive ones. So this is a good, new, uh, good news. And this is how the um, 
probe that is supposed to go into um, those um, Shank 3 mice looks right now. We have several electrodes um, surrounding, in this case, a hollow channel where we fed a different waveguide in and connected it to this um, PCB here and to a ferro. So that's good to go. And in summary, I have shown you that there is a requirement for multifunctional biocompatible probes. And using thermal drawing process, it is possible to fabricate probes for long-term recording of neural activity and optogenetic inter uh, interrogation and drug delivery. And those probes are highly compatible. And these are the people and funding sources I have to thank most. And I thank you for your attention. Can you comment on the uh, inserting them into the brain? If you're matching the stiffness to the, you know, the stiffness of uh, of neural tissue, does that yes. make it difficult to stick them deep to into the cortex? To that, we stiffen the probes before the insertion with um, polyethylene glycol, which is then absorbed by the tissue within a few hours, half an hour to a couple of hours. Oh, okay. So you have it stiffened while you insert it, and then it goes to the flexible state. Yeah, and that's working well. Yeah, that, that's how we did it. So. so how many, so each of those probes is like a human hair, 100 microns, 80 microns? There's micron. seven electrodes. Yes, probes your last one. Yeah. And, so, and it has seven recording sites. <coughs> Can you record from all seven? Uh, not yet, we are working on that. We have um, found several. Um, do you need to etch it, or or do you need to expose right those tips in some way, or um, you what do you think it will take to use? Back to some extent, and then you fiddle around right now with the um, wires and connect them to a PCB, and we achieved five out of seven so far. And how many of them, I guess it's just limited by how big a hole you can make, but each of them is very flexible, and you can put in multiple probes into the basal ganglia, say, of the body. In theory, you can do that, yes. Did it ever happen, some of the probe broke in the brain? No. <laughs> no? No, it didn't. Also, not while inserting it, which was nice. I mean, if you come from those silicon-based <coughs> things that you shouldn't even look at in the wrong way before they break, um, yeah, that's quite different. They are not indestructible, but they perform far better than what I had known before. What is the final transmission of the probe? The final transmission? You mean? I mean, that depends with the. So you should with normalize what? transmission, but is that normalized to like? If you put like 30 milliwatts of power into one end, that depends a lot. We achieved um, with with this kind of probe, we achieved um, around um, under under ideal additions when your laser power source is is perfect, around half of the amount we actually put in. So that first first fiber, I think that's where, which is, which is not necessarily the case for um, every time you do that. But um, under all circumstances, it's possible to um, achieve the um, five uh, millivolts per square millimeter um, thing with a 100 milliwatt laser um, at the outside, which is the um, limit. Um, considered useful for, for of the genetics. Uh, you showed um, stability data up to two months. I'm wondering what's the furthest out that you have looked. Um, we have looked for six months in an animal that showed single unit activity, 
um, but after six months the single units were different single units than the ones we had in the beginning. So that's, that's the current state there. Um, here we showed for two months because at some point we had to submit that. Yes. <laughs> Is the major reason for brain damage uh, the reactive astrocytes, or what? Uh, what? Uh, uh, even though your material, I assume, is very inert, yeah. uh, is it just irritation of astrocytes? They're releasing chemicals. Is this okay. some other thing that you have some, yeah, some handle on? Widely speculative from my side. Some are convinced, like the Belanconda lab, um, that it's mainly because of the chronic breach of the blood brain barrier. Um, but I assume it's a combination of a lot of factors, um, especially that clear scaring will reduce your um, signal to noise ratio because you have less active neurons around um, your implantation site. And um, if that damage continues, that will decrease it further. Are your probes better with respect to long-term viability than other probes? Yes. How do you know? <laughs> because of the high signal-to-noise ratio we have, even when we start there, and from that I mean, from the biocompatibility study, um, we don't didn't correlate yet that activity directly with the amount of um, of the damage measurable, just in an indirect way. The you argued that it's the stiffness mismatch that is responsible, at least in part, for the damage, and yes. it seems to me that these the design of these probes offers a way to test that very explicitly in a way that probably not, not many other people could do, right? You could presumably have a cause of varying stiffness yes. with while not changing the stuff that's in contact with the tissue. I wonder, have you considered that? We and considered that, but that's to be done. Right. Am I right, though, in thinking that's that's not really been rigorously demonstrated yet by anybody? No. But it's, yeah. it's stiffness. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's an interesting idea. You can do that. You can play around with the shape. Right. Different materials, even though they are similar to that and allow for that flexibility. Yeah. You can okay. go into a lot of, of degrees of freedom there and mm -hmm. dimensions if you. And also, presumably, there's a, a transient stiffness mismatch due to the polyethylene glycol, right? I mean, there might, the, it might be that a lot of the damage happens in whatever it is, the first hours or days or however long it takes to absorb that stiffening. I mean, we didn't observe that much of the damage right after inserting those following this biocompatibility study we did. So I don't think that that is a big uh, contributor to that. In your, implantation, in your implantation surgeries, do you keep the animals anesthetized for the entire time it takes the fibers to soften? Um, we didn't test that, but we assume that the thin layers that we try to get on there are gone pretty soon. I would say they are gone after half an hour, yeah. and at that time, all elements are still asleep. So we won't have a lot of movement, if that's what you're referring to, that might damage it in the first place. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.